Hello, I'm Sarah from Heart Over Hearts, and this is the Book Two Prize quarterfinals uh, conversation where I talk about the rankings. Uh, this is unexpected because I was not uh, uh, supposed to be a judge for this round. Uh, I did last year. I did all of the quarters, so all four quarters, and it was a lot of reading. So I begged off the first two quarters and said, "Oh well, I'll do the the back half uh, for this year." Well, I was in a conversation with a few people, uh, Robert from Barter Hordes, who, as we all know, started the Book Two Prize, uh, said, oh, no, a judge just had to bow out. And it was halfway through this round. Uh, I said, well, is it fiction or nonfiction? He said fiction. I said, "Okay, well, what are the books? And when he mentioned them, uh, so there's six books in a category. I had read five of the six already. So I said, put me in, I'll, 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 I'll take it. I'll read the, the last book, uh, and, and do the reviews and, uh, and rank them. So, uh, very, very glad that I did because li- literally right after that, another judge bowed out and that was for nonfiction. So Robert took that one. I took this one and all is well in book two prize land. So this was was really interesting because I'd read these books without the context of the book to prize. Uh, So keep that in mind. I have three physical copies and three that I will show you because I, I don't own copies of those. What I found in this round is that I actually liked all the books. And so this is very difficult. In previous rounds, it was very clear what was at the bottom and what was at the top. And then it's just really the ones that that are tricky are numbers three and four, because three, the top three are have the potential to progress progress into the next round. And the bottom three uh, tend to uh, drop. So let me explain a little bit about the book two prize for you. It's four rounds. We start with this massive list that that uh, then gets divided up among many groups. But each group has no more than six books. And uh, so each and there are multiple judges within each group. The groups then, uh, when we submit our ballots at the end of the end of the judging time frame, which is two months, uh, each each group is then tallied, and the top three books from that stack ranking move on to the next round, and then the the, the full list is then broken into six books again, groups of six books, and then sent out. And we do that until we arrive with one group, one uh, final group of six books that will lead us to the book two prize winner. So the the trick here really is comparing the books against each other and what is stronger, what is weaker, which do you think uh, are, are are better to move forward in the prize? A lot of these books I read before, so I had to kind of come back to them with fresh eyes. I did not reread them, so but I do remember these very, very distinctly. So with that said, let me get into the rankings, which I'm sure you you want to know. So let me first introduce the books that are in this group. This is group C in alphabetical order by the name of the author. First up is Jim Patrol on the Purple Line by Deepa Anapara. Second is Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. And I've got this gorgeous UK edition cover that I just, mm, delicious. Next up is Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. Then My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. Then The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. And lastly, Summer by Ali Smith. Now, another irony is that I did three of these, the three that I actually have books for, I did as buddy reads. So I think my buddy readers might be interested and curious as to how their book that I read with them ranks against the others. And I bet there's going to be some surprises in in how I ended up ranking these. Without further ado, let's talk about them. Uh, in, In order of how I ranked them from bottom to top. This might surprise some of you, but I put in number six, Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. 
But let me say, this does not mean this is a bad book. This was a really good book, and I found it fun and so readable. Uh, this book, you just you're in the hands of a master, and he's telling the story of a rock band, a a an imaginary rock band out of London in 1967. And the way he tells the story is he, he breaks up the sections into and the chapters into different points of view of the different members of the band. And this could have been a, a you know, kind of typical trite, you know, band story. Uh, but in the hands of David Mitchell, he really makes it uh, more effervescent, a little more interesting, uh, more richness. So many characters and so, and so many real life uh, cameos kind of pop and interweave through the story as we see the band, uh, the individual band members uh, go, struggling, coming together, forming this band and then their success and challenges along the way. Uh, I did. This is my first David Mitchell I've ever read, and I read it with uh, Charles Heathcote. So I'll put a link to his channel below as well. And we just enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. Now there wasn't a lot to really discuss uh, because it's not that kind of book. Again, you're you're in the hands of a master. You're just reading and 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 you're 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 being told a, a very enjoyable interesting story but it's not like there was depth to plumb to plumb and and a lot of insights and things that you wanted to go back and explore uh, so again this is a good book it just in comparison didn't didn't have the same gravitas that some of the others did so what made number 5 then uh, so for number five, I put Gin Patrol on the purple line. In this book, we have the very real difficult topics of uh, child trafficking, uh, slum life in India, uh, all told through these child child narrators. So these kids that are living in the slum are, are start to hear that some of the people in their school, young kids in their school go missing, are, are being taken. And in the childlike ways, they, they imagine what's possibly happening. Our, our main narrator is obsessed with uh, TV shows, uh, private detective TV shows, and wants to uh, take this on and solve this case. Uh, it's, it, it, there are things in here that I found charming. There are things in here that I found so difficult because we as adults reading this understand better than what the child understands and sees and, and what he's reacting to. I thought the characters were, were fun. And I usually do not like child characters. I usually do not like child narrators. Uh, this one I didn't find as insufferable, uh, as pretentious as I normally find. Some of my challenges with the book were that I thought the pacing was a little off uh, or uneven, I guess is, is a better way to say it. Uh, and so there were some, some spots where it, it, it kind of seeped for me. But I still remember uh, very clearly scenes in this book uh, that, that gave me tension and, and angst and fear for these children. Um, and so I, for that, because it stayed in my mind, because it's a serious topic told very well, um, because it talks about race and class and how the, the 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 slum is kind of centered next to all of these buildings that are being erected and you've got this class divide that is immediately uh, coming together and and creating so much tension in the lives of these characters uh, that's why this one was number five i think this one's going to be a shocker number four is a book that was in a quartet that I actually did a special uh, group reading of. We read the entire quartet and ended with Ali Smith's Summer. Again, this is a great book. Why is it number number four uh, in in the controversial most controversial spot next to the first? Uh, because number four means that I don't think this should move forward. Um, 
Let me tell you a little bit about what, what the story is about. What she has done in the quartet is she is writing uh, contemporary, very quick story um, and I'm going straight to publication about what's happening in the moment and what is the material that she's kind of sifting through. Uh, she's leveraging and talking about in Ali Smith style, things like the rise of fascism in the far right. Um, she's talking about Brexit borders. She's talking about family immigration. She's talking about uh, health care. She's talking about end of life. She's talking about uh, the connections. She's so smart. Uh, reading her books are like puzzles. They are, she writes in an experimental fiction style. Uh, but you get to me this this in the quartet gave had a lot of heart. It had a lot of interesting things. It also had a child character that terrified me. Uh, a ve a very different than the child characters in Gin Patrol on the Purple Line. We have a, a young man who's incredibly intelligent and who is kind of playing uh, with fascism and playing with these ideas of. Uh, of of power and and what's uh, black and white right and wrong um and he has a cruel streak to him that really terrified me but that's not why i put this book in the fourth position i put this book in the fourth position because i am not convinced that it would that the richness stands if you haven't read the quartet i'm afraid that as a standalone uh this would get lost in the shuffle it's it's good, but it, but the richness comes from the the tapestry created by the threads that are pulled from the other books, the characters from the first book reappearing in this last one of the quartet, and the the almost the fan service of giving us little things that we that we know that we see because we've seen it happen before. We know that character. We know that story becomes incredibly uh, comforting and it gives you uh, a footing. Whereas Ali Smith is, is, you know, she is a challenging writer. Uh, you have to pay attention and you have to kind of go in and, and be willing to go along on the ride. I don't know if the ride pays off if you're reading this as a standalone. And I can't imagine that many judges are reading the full tr the, the three other books before arriving here, unless they're already interested in the material. So for that reason, I've put this in the fourth position. Okay, what's in the top three then? Uh, surprising to me, uh, My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell it appears in third position. I did not know what to expect going into this. I wasn't sure I was going to like it. I wasn't sure. This is a kind of Lolita flip uh, told by a woman who was groomed by her teacher, not a stepfather. Uh, but groomed from her teacher to um, to be in a relation an inappropriate relationship with him when she was in high school. What I found so already it's such a jarring, such a skeezy premise that you know you go in kind of girding your your yourself against uh, what you're about to read. Uh, but what I found was that while it wasn't necessarily the strongest book, it resonated. It really resonated because what we're seeing is a woman who is struggling. Uh, she, the book opens with, uh, with uh, a Twitter, uh, you know, a social media storm about a woman who is saying that she was molested by this by a teacher. And the teacher is the man that she was also in a relationship with. And she was in a relationship with him for a number of years. And we see her instincts to protect him and her instincts are to defend him uh, as opposed to listening of the story that this woman's telling. And all the ways in which her accepting this other woman's story will, is confronting her understanding of her past. 
Uh, and so much of it has to do with how she sees herself as making her own choices, not recognizing the manipulation of grooming. So her, her groomer, her teacher would ask her every step of the way, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? And what seemed like innocuous, small uh, questions of consent became bigger and bigger and bigger and layered on top of each other. And at a certain point, she was in too deep to really know, did she consent to this? Consenting to a small thing versus consenting to a sexual relationship with a fully adult male, uh, middle-aged male, as a teenager. Is that what she was consenting to? But watching her deconstruct it, it was almost like watching someone get deprogrammed from a cult. So you go back in time and you get to see the story of how their relationship progressed and, and how she was made to feel that she was empowered. She was made to feel that she was making choices and, and all of this. And so uh, I felt that because she wanted to own her story and didn't want to be seen as a victim and didn't want to know that she was capable of being manipulated in that way, she held firm to her point of view. Uh, yeah, it was, I, I'm still thinking about it. I found it much more interesting than I expected to find. I think it has... Um, some resonance in in conversations that are still happening in in the in the broader context of of our society as we're struggling with me too uh, and i think the dynamic of her and the other woman who has actually come out was also very very interesting uh so for that reason i gave that in put that in the third spot all right so what's number two uh huh. This was also challenging, maybe, maybe surprising. Despite how much I absolutely adored Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, I put it in the second spot. What I loved about this book was the richness. I felt fully immersed in this village, the Stratford-upon-Avon, 1596, where we're meeting the woman who will become the wife of of William Shakespeare, uh, he, he who is never mentioned by name in the book. Thank you for that, Maggie. And uh, we see her, we see him meeting her, we see him uh, falling in love with her, her being interested in, in him, and then them starting a family and then him leaving to leaving her uh, to kind of set up her own, her, her own home uh, while he goes to London to become this playwright. And we see her in, as a healer in the village. We see her with her deep love of her family. She's just such a rich, rich character. It was tender. It was emotional. It was beautiful. Uh, the story of the tick journey, because uh, a plague also happens in, in, this, in this book as we're and reading it in coronavirus uh, lockdown. Uh, I still remember that story with uh, detail, rich, rich detail. Uh, some of this felt very cinematic uh, scenes that I still remember. I can see it in my mind's eye. Uh, I just, I really, really loved this book. But it's a number two. Number one for me is Carter Sickles' The Prettiest Star. Oh, I knew going into this that this would be uh, a challenging one for me. Uh, the Pretty Star is the story of a young man who goes, who is dying. He's dying of a new disease that has just come out and it's afflicting gay men. Uh, so this is in the 1980s and he had left home. Uh, he recognized he was a gay man and the oppressive Ohio community, small town that he lived in, and specifically the hyper masculine father who um, just could not accept him as a gay man, made him flee to the big city. And so he, like so many others, he went to New York and fell in love and fell in love with a man uh, who ended up dying of this brand new disease uh, called HIV. 
so his life ha- in New York has fallen apart, has fallen apart, and he wants to come home, uh, and he knows he's dying. So this is him returning home to die in Ohio. Uh, it's it, the heart in this book, the characters. I know these people. I have met these people. Um, I the story was so profound. Uh, but told in very down-to-earth, real ways. Uh, You get a sense of the 1980s in this Ohio town. Uh, You get these characters uh, from both sides of his life, Um, the characters from New York, uh, as well as his Ohio family. And we see all of the ways that everyone's life is impacted and affected by not just the disease, but his his decision to come home, because it is a clarion call for certain members of his family uh, to face what they have not wanted to face before, uh, and and the the uh, tension that that causes, and the pain, and the transformation. I found this to be important, um, well told. I think the characters were rich. Uh, the grandmother just, oh God, did I love her. Um, the style, the setting, everything was, this is a full package. It's, it's, it's all there. And I thought it was rendered so incredibly well. And so for that reason, I had to put this as number one. So that's it. That's my rankings. I would love to know what are your thoughts, uh, specifically the people that I buddy read some of these books with. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching. And I can't wait to hear what you think about these books and how would you have ranked them? That's it for now. Thank you so much and look forward to talking to you later. Bye.